Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. My name is Ware Harmon, and I'm the Executive Director of Town Hall Seattle. And on behalf of the organization and our friends today at Third Place Books, our friends every day, our partners, I mean, today at Third Place Books, <laughs> it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's this afternoon's live presentation of Andre Gregory in conversation with Todd London. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded territory of of the Coast Save people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we thank you all for tuning in. Beautiful, beautiful Saturday in Seattle. Town Hall is sincerely grateful for the opportunity to invite Seattle audiences and well beyond into present tense exchanges of issues, ideas, and creativity, even when we don't get to do it in person. Town Hall will continue to produce online content throughout this fall and into the new year, and as circumstances allow, to begin to host live streams from our building. While if, like me, you simply can't find enough time in front of Zoom or YouTube, know that many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form under the header Digital Media. Back to today's program, it'll last about an hour, uh, including an audience Q&A. Uh, to ask your own question, use the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. Keep it succinct, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Also, know that you can view the event both here on Crowdcast or over on our YouTube page if you want to utilize that platform's closed getting feature. Town Hall is adding new programs every day. A um, few upcoming events before a healthy midwinter holiday include Ed Power conversation with Craig Gordon on the latest predictive strategies uh, for avalanches, Michael Eric Dyson in conversation with Robin D'Angelo discussing the prospects for authentic and durable racial reconciliation in America, and a discussion of the essential resilience of theater with uh, critic Michael Riedel and Broadway producer David Stone. Uh, check out our calendar at tlseattle.org for plenty more. Our work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Arts and Culture in particular uh, is supported by Forker, Arts Fund, Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, and the Wincoat Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is at heart a member-supported organization. I want to thank all of our members watching this afternoon. For the rest of you, if you share Town Hall's dedication to a community invigorated by arts and ideas and dedicated to giving voice to as many perspectives as we can stuff into our building, physically or metaphorically, we hope you'll consider a gift or a membership as well. One last piece of infomercial. You'll certainly want to learn more about this afternoon's uh, topic, uh, Mr. Gregory, that is. And so I hope you'll consider purchasing your copy of the book here this afternoon from our partners at Third Place Books. If you keep it local, just maybe the things that we love about this place from before the pandemic will still be around to delight us on the other side. All right. Andre Gregory has been one of American theater's most consistently engaging, confounding, and inspiring figure for half a century. His early avant-garde productions, principally developed through ensemble collaboration, established a reputation for challenging work. He founded his own company, The Manhattan Project, in 1960 and shuttered it in 1975. The same year he directed Our Late Night, the first produced play by Wally Shawn, uh, which began a long working relation between the two, featuring the now dairy My Dinner with Andre, which was created by Gregory, Sean, and Louis Malle. Low less an authority than Wikipedia describes his 1975 decision this way. Gregory's growing misgivings about the role of theater in modern life and what he felt was a trend toward fascism in the United States, if he only knew then what we all know now, uh, led him to abandon theater abruptly and leave the country. All I can say is that, that moment of self-doubt has always seemed to me like a kind of Rosetta Stone to a career spent uh, questioning how, why, and why bother of artistic life. Gregory is also an actor, writer, teacher, and painter. One of his paintings is actually featured as the cover art on the book, and he's author of a poetry collection, Bone Songs, published in 2006. Todd London is the director of the newly formed Dramatist Guild Institute of Field Learning and teaches at the New School of Drama, where he most recently headed the MFA playwriting program. Many of you will also know him as the former executive director of the University of Washington School of Drama, a post he held from 2014 through 18. He's also the, an author whose books include An Ideal Theater, Founding Visions for a New American Art, and Importance of Staying Earnest, both from 2013. He's written, edited, or contributed to more than 20 other books, including novels. And his second, If You See Him, Let Him Know, was published in February of this year. Gregory's book, This Is Not My Memoir, which London co-authored, is the subject of this afternoon's talk. Please join me in welcoming Andre Gregory and Todd London. Hello. Uh -huh. Hello. Hey, Hello. Seattle. Thank you, Ware. That was really beautiful. It's so good to see you again. It's so nice to be back in Seattle. Yay, uh, Andre? 
Uh, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> On this beautiful day, it's I would fairly probably most of you weren't born. A few, yeah. a few days ago, a few days ago, I actually saw a feature film that was shot in Seattle, and I said to my wife Cindy, "My God, what are all those skyscrapers doing there?" When I was here. The only tall building was the Space Needle. There was nothing else. It, it was coming to Seattle was a little bit like crossing the frontier and coming to the ends of the earth, believe it or not. Mm. In fact, Seattle was so unsophisticated nice. that if you ordered a dry martini in a restaurant, they gave it to you with a cherry inside. <laughs> Um, well, probably what people don't know, and what you may even not remember, Andreas, um, what a big role Seattle played in the writing of this book. So in 2013, the end of 2013, Andre, you asked me out to lunch at a little place on Perry Street, down the street from where you used to live. And you asked me to work on this book with you. And I said, well, I'm considering, I'm being considered for a job in Seattle. I don't know if you remember what you said. You said, I love Seattle and I have an umbrella. <laughs> Not realizing that no one carries umbrellas. In the so that no was sort of carries thing. umbrellas in Seattle? No, they're used to it. They're too uh -huh. tough. Um, and then uh, just a shout out to uh, we were mentioned UW School of Drama. Um, a, a, for four of the six years we were working on this book, I was supported there. Um, by the Floyd U. Jones Endowed Chair for Theater, which had um, uh, research funds, which actually helped me fly back and forth and worked work with Andre, both in New York and in Truro, Massachusetts, Cape Cod, where he is now, where you are now. Um, so let's talk about being in Seattle, Andre. Let's talk about what it was like in 1963 when you went there and why uh, you were there. I don't. Does everyone in Seattle still know that one of the great schools of American poets was in Seattle? Is that known? I don't know. People know about Theodore Rotka. People know about the Seattle poets. I don't know. Why don't you t talk about what, what you think of that? Well, all, all I remember was that there were great poets, mm -hmm. uh, that many of them had been blackballed uh, by a pre-McCarthy communist hearing and lived in Seattle because it was one of the few liberal safe places that they could live. So there was, was a great tradition mm. of writing in Seattle. Yeah. Miriam um, Rookhouse, was she in Seattle? I'm not yeah. sure. I'm not yeah. sure. I do know, I mean, I know Third Place Books really well. That's the partner for today. And they have just a beautiful collection there. So. I don't think there was a bookstore in Seattle when I was here. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you got there in 63. They had just started founding arts institutions in the World's Fairgrounds. And, and this is something people don't know, I think, which is that you were the first associate artistic director of the newly founded Seattle Repertory Theater. You directed- and if they knew that, which yeah, they and, probably don't. Yeah. They, they probably don't know that I was fired before my production could open. So why don't you tell us what happened? Uh, you know, <laughs> it's in the book, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that there was a kind of competitiveness between the older artistic director. Stuart and, Vaughan, yeah. And we I both was, started at the same time, yeah? Yeah. We started yeah. together. Yeah, you know, he had the power, he didn't like me. And one day I showed up for rehearsal and the stage door was locked. And that was it. And what were you rehearsing? Uh, the Firebugs by Max Frisch. Mm. And I remember going home, you know, it's an awful thing. Have you ever been fired, Todd? Yes. Yeah, it's an awful feeling. It's a really awful feeling. And about a week after I got fired, I knew the New York Times had reviewed my production. And I thought that I might leave, not with my tail between my legs, but feeling a little happier if I got a good review. And I, I called the Times and the guy started reading my review to me and it was wonderful. And then he suddenly said, oh no, 
Oh my God. Oh no. The president has been shot. And that was Kennedy, of course. Wow. So this is November 63. Yeah. And um, wow. And you didn't know that at the moment. You didn't know Kennedy had been shot. Andre, uh, I'm losing you. Are you freezing? Uh, is there somebody at Town Hall who can tell me if we're still connected? I, I Hi, hear Todd. Voice. Yes. Hi, Todd. This is Josh from Town Hall. Um, yes, I am still seeing and hearing you, which indicates to me that the audience can as well. Looks like we may have lost Andre. Okay. Um, but yeah, just give me a sec. We'll we'll reach out to him. Um, okay. And we'll have it right back. In a second. And I'll continue to talk. Um, sure. Yeah, go so, right ahead. So I'm going to vamp a little for the people at Town Hall while we get Andre back on. So just to give you a little background, um, at this moment, it's 1963. Um, Bagley Wright and some other patrons, as I understand it, had founded the Seattle Rep. Um, they bring in a guy from New York named Stuart Vaughn, who was a director and a playwright. He had worked um, a lot at the uh, New York Shakespeare Festival and then bring in Andre as the associate artistic director, which lasts all of less than six months. Um, I really want you to hear about this production of the Firebugs by Max Frisch, because um, there's something when we talk, when I think about Andre's early work that really distinguishes it from the work many of us know from later, those of you who know about or know his Alice in Wonderland with the Manhattan Project, and certainly from film, you might know uh, his Uncle Vanya, which became Vanya on 42nd Street, directed by Louis Malle, who also did My Dinner with Andre, and later uh, Master Builder, which was also a partnership with Wally Shawn, directed by Jonathan Demme on film. And there's an incredible simplicity to that work, a kind of paired back, um, very casual, minimal style. Whereas his early work at the Seattle Rep, um, which I, I hope he returns to tell you about. And uh, after he got fired from the Rep, he founded a theater in Philadelphia, Theater of the Living Arts, where he was also fired. And then he went to uh, Gregory Peck's uh, invitation. He went to found the Intercultural Arts um, Center in LA in the Watts neighborhood, and he was fired summarily and quickly from all of them. The Theater of the Living Arts lasted for three years, but the productions themselves were incredibly elaborate and crazy and theatrical. Um, the uh, the production that got him fired in mid Philadelphia was on a play called Becklek um, by a playwright named Rochelle Owens. Um, it took place in a kind of hallucinogenic suburban nightmare ideal of, um, or fantasy of um, Africa. He had um, a local, um, a really stellar African-American dance company working with him, Arthur Hall. He had uh, uh, Tejo Ito's um, uh, drumming band working with him. It was huge, elaborate. People would enter through the alleyway. There were, you know, overgrown statues with condoms filled with water, and each of the audience would get an axe and have to split one. And they were totally opulent and extravagant productions. And then over time, and this is something I, um, I think is so clear in the book, the way it's connected to both a spiritual journey and an artistic one, that the work gets simpler, the relationships get deeper, the work gets less angry because the early work is super hostile. And clearly the man was a little hostile too if he was getting fired from theater after theater like that. Um, so those are some things I hope to talk about when we get back. Um, Josh, are we getting any, uh, are we having any luck? Yeah, so apparently uh, their power went out due to a wind windstorm. So oh, they're they're, storm in Cape Cod. Yeah, so they're, they're resolving that now. Um, it looks like 
Andre is in the room. I've sent the invite. I'm just waiting okay. on him at this point. So um, All right. <laughs> I just don't know I'm if you're happy able to talk. Keep... You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read a little passage about the play. Great idea. Seattle Rep. Perfect. So this is, this is from um, this is from the short part where Andre Gregory is the Associate Artistic Director at Seattle Rep. Um, he, he mentions Vaughn, that's Stuart Vaughn, the artistic director. Vaughn and I were oil and water. I found him pedantic and academic, and he must have found me to be trouble. He opened the theater, the theater and the season and the theater with King Lear, followed by my production of Max Frisch's Firebugs, a political satire about the rise of Hitler and bourgeois complacency. In the play, Two clown-faced arsonists pretending to be traveling salesmen, obviously Hitler and Goebbels, talk their way into houses all over town. The pyromaniacs go door to door, setting attic fires everywhere, but the townspeople still refuse to believe that evil can come to them. A mock Greek chorus of firemen chants, call us in, call us in. I didn't really know what I was doing. So at this point, Andres directed maybe one play. So I felt my way forward tentatively. I sent the chorus to a local school for firemen to learn how firemen hold the hoses. We found out they do it differently in different cities. It gave them a style, an extraordinary look. My staging of the ending was quite theatrical as the town is going up in flames, an actual fire engine drove onto the stage. A large round trampoline was lowered from the fly loft and films of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima were projected onto it. The proscenium arch was covered with blowups of newsprint articles about Seattle scandals that had been swept under the rug. The engine ladders swarming with firemen swung out over the auditorium the firemen threw handfuls of confetti. Doris Day sang, Que sera, sera, I was fired. I had just turned 30. Hey, Andre, I was just reading about your production of Firebugs. That sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what can, welcome back. Thank what can you. you. What can you add um, just about that moment in Seattle? And then we'll move on because clearly we lost a little time. Uh, well, I guess the only thing, well, my daughter was conceived in Seattle mm. during rehearsals for the firebugs. Maybe that's the most important thing that yeah. happened. And maybe if you had spent more time rehearsing the play, that never would have happened. Anyway. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really exciting. Yeah. And then she was, your, Chiquito, your wife was pregnant with yeah. Marina when you left? Or had yeah. she, been, she wasn't born in no, Seattle? We, uh, we went, we went to Seattle, I think, uh, Chiquita and me, and we had two Scotch Terriers. Mm -hmm. And by the time we left Seattle, uh, the Terrier was pregnant and Chiquita was pregnant. So when we arrived back in New York, we'd left only two people. We got back and we were not. <laughs> okay. So let's, um, so let's move on. Here's what I said about you when you were gone. I said you were fired from three theaters consecutively. I said that one of the things that really interests me about the arc of your work is how that early work was extravagant and theatrical and very showy, you know, and I read the passage about the fire engine and the trampolines and mm -hmm. um, the Hiroshima projections and how the work moves to a much simpler and more quieter place as we go. So we're going to get to that. But first, I want to ask you about something that um, Ware talked about in his introduction, which he was talking about your awareness at the time of my dinner with Andre about the move in America towards a sort of fascism. Um, can you talk a little bit about your family history? Because while we were working on the book and we were talking from Seattle to New York, I was aware that you were going through a kind of PTSD in, especially once we got into the Trump years. Um, and that seems to me a real strong background to the, uh, the stories of the book. Can you talk a little bit about where you came from? Yeah. Uh, when, when Trump was elected, uh, I went to the neighboring hotel, which had a coffee bar that I liked. 
and there was a lovely young boy. He must have been about four, and he had a hood that he kept pulling over his head. So I started playing with him, you know. And then he suddenly said to me, my dad says Trump won't kill me. Is that true? And I said, no, he won't. But having escaped as a Jew from Europe in 1939 and recognizing Trump immediately for the sadistic fascist that he was and is, I could see myself in that little boy. Mm -hmm. And I could go back to those terrifying years in Paris uh, just before the war, we we got the last boat train to London out of France. Um, when we got a ship to the United States, there was a sister ship traveling about a mile away. It was torpedoed. We saw survivors. Uh, we picked up survivors. We saw people drowning in the water. When my brother Alex and I had been in London before we took that boat, we were outfitted for gas masks because the war was beginning. So, you know, and my father, uh, my father was in a fur business with Trotsky in the Soviet Union. He was imprisoned in the Soviet Union. Um, he, he knew fascism firsthand. In fact, I guess about a year before he died, he said to me, you know, if I were young, I'd leave America. And I said, why? And he said, both parties have become so corrupt, it can only lead to fascism. So I've been, I grew up in fascism or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, with people, terror. My, my parents were so terrified yeah. that when they were in their 70s, the doorbell of their New York apartment could ring. Somebody unexpected. Uh, and they were too, they started sweating and they were too terrified to move and go and open the door. Mm -hmm. So we all had PTSD from fascism. Yeah. So they, and they had left prior to your leaving Paris, they had left Russia, gone to Germany, left Germany just as Hitler rose? Uh, as yes. Yeah. They made, they made a trip to America. I think in 1936, before we actually left to see if they liked America. And there was, you're smiling because I'm sure you know this story. Uh, there was a stevedore strike. So none of the baggage was being unloaded. And they went to their hotel and it was very hot. It was an August day or a July day. And they said, how can we get cool? Because rooms weren't air conditioned course at that time and the guy at the desk said why don't you go to an air-cooled movie so they went to an air-cooled movie and as they were watching the movie two guys walked down the aisle pulled somebody out of his chair shot him in the stomach and left my parents went back to their boat never got their luggage back went back to europe and only hitler was more terrifying than this barbarous, gangster-ridden hmm. America that they had visited. Right. And then they get here and they're sort of part of this Hollywood world in the summers or in the winters, I guess. And they're, you know, and one of your mom's poker playing friends is Bugsy Siegel? Bugsy Siegel, yeah, the guy who, the guy who uh, created Las Vegas, I guess. Uh -huh. He used to play gin rummy with him every week. <laughs> I hope so you they, believe these stories more than you did in the beginning. Well, you know, I looked them. I, you know, I I fact checked the hell out of this book as we were working mm -hmm. on it, as you know. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, it's interesting because you bring that up because your life has been so storied, and your stories, like the like even the early productions, are so fabulous and so. Um, extreme and the people who enter your life are mythic your mother having an affair with errol flynn you know uh the kinds of people that we we hear about and yet every time we would talk about those things and i would really 
I mean, we do two things in the book. One is we set up the story and how a story has different requirements than a true story, <laughs> than, than a documentary. But also I was always struck that um, the stories, as far as I could tell, were absolutely true. The details somewhat, sometimes you had um, not embellished, but kind of made better for story. Like I remember yeah. you telling, one of the, the example I give people is, um, you talked about when you came to New York, this is after Seattle, this is after, um, I guess, Philadelphia, and you get a job as an assistant stage manager at the Phoenix Theater. And you talked about Billie Holiday doing a, being taken out of the prison hospital for a, um, a gala performance, a fundraiser at the theater, and that you held her up as she sang, you and another stage manager. And she then they, very Ill. Yeah. she was very ill. They sent her back to the prison hospital where she was for heroin, I guess. And, um, and then she died that night. And I was like, no, that can't be. I don't believe you, Andre. And then I, I did the research and I found out everything about that story was true, except she had died like six weeks later, but it was right. her last performance. Right. But you made it better by saying yeah. she died that <laughs> night. It's a better story. <laughs> yeah, well, um, you know, um, uh, Spalding Gray, the storyteller, yeah. um, once said to me that if, if you have the vocation of a storyteller, if you're truly a storyteller, all you have to do is stand still and the story will come to you. Mm. You don't have to invent, you don't have to go after it. Yeah. Stories chase the storyteller. Mm. So but that, you know, yeah. I, I, was, I was just gonna say, uh, when I look at This Is Not My Memoir, or listen to you, or, you know, I can't believe, I really can't, that I've lived this life. Mm -hmm. It just seems too amazing to be true. Yeah. It is kind of amazing, and yet it is true. So, I mean, I mean, let's talk about that a little because, you know, part of what made so. So, when people think about my dinner with Andre, which we we should definitely talk about it, even though we're going out of sequence here, um, I think they think about so it. As, the book. We don't have to go into. Sequence. Yeah, we don't have to go into sequence. This yeah. is yeah. People in Seattle are progressive. They understand. Um, when you talk about um, in um, my dinner with Andre, it's kind of uh, a spiritual quest movie, or it's a and it's filled with these stories. You go to the Sahara Desert, you eat sand, you're buried alive on your friend's estate in Montauk. You you know one thing after another, and yet these things actually happened yeah. to you. Is that just you standing still in your life and waiting to, for stories to come? Or was there a kind of itch or restlessness that you had? Well, there was definitely an itch and restlessness. And I wasn't going after stories. But of course, if you say to yourself, if you're working on The Little Prince, which I was for a while, if you say to yourself, oh, maybe I should go to the desert and rent a couple of camels and go out in the <laughs> desert, Something will happen. <laughs> yeah. You don't know what will happen. But you know, recently, Cindy was cleaning out our basement and she found one of the 33, I think, diaries that I kept uh, during uh, what turned out to be the My Dinner with Andre years. And I thought, this is amazing, really. You look at my dinner with Andre, it seems like the simplest thing in the world. It seems improvised. But I kept 33 diaries. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I went to the Tunisian Sahara. I went to the Polish forest. Uh, an enormous, you know, one diary might end up with one little paragraph of dialogue that yeah. went into the movie. Yeah. I think it's really important, particularly if there are artists here today, is to realize what an enormous amount of work goes into creating a work of art. It doesn't mm -hmm. just happen on its own. 
Hmm. Well, you and I know from working on this book, seven years. Yeah. Hey, will you, speaking of that and those diary entries, will you read about Ladakh a little bit on page? Um, so one of my favorite journey stories, it's on page um, 112 and 113. And if you start on page one, set it up for us and then start on 112, where, you, where it starts from there, the two pilgrims drove me to the Hamas so, Monastery on 112. So where uh, it says, from there, the two pilgrims drove me to the Hemis Monastery. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is one of my favorite stories because it's it's also a story about um, so much of the message of your work and of the book is really about kind of waking up, staying awake, waking up to what life is and what's um, even to the invisible sometimes. And this yeah, is like fact, the beginning. There's, 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 of course, a a quote uh, from my dinner with Andre that has gone viral. I think it's reached 16 million people who probably never saw my dinner with Andre and probably have no idea uh, who Wally and I are, except maybe Wally from Princess Bride. Yeah. But the main, the, the kernel of that piece is wake up. Mm. Americans are falling asleep. If you fall asleep, fascism could come to America. So um, the, the idea of waking up is central to almost every spiritual discipline I know. Yeah. But yeah, I'll read this. So read this. Read it through to the end of that chapter. Okay. From there, the two pilgrims drove me to Hemus Monastery, also in Ladakh. It looked like a building out of a ghost town, run down, dilapidated, with tattered prayer flags fluttering in the wind. There was no one around until a German abbot appeared and asked us if we would like to have Darshan with the Rinpoche. A man entered the room and the two women immediately prostrated themselves on the floor. I didn't know what to do. Should I go down on the ground lightly to be polite or would that be hypocritical? I was too awkward and confused about protocol even look at the man himself and then i did let me point out here that i was not at that point in my life a spiritual man i had no interest in spiritual books i considered myself an agnostic i was like saul of tarsus a businessman on his way to damascus when he saw christ saul's life was changed forever he became paul the businessman became the apostle. I should point out uh, that when Saul of Tarsus met Christ on the road to Damascus, Christ had been dead for 200 years and Saul had never heard of Christ. You know, so we're dealing with the miraculous here. Mm -hmm. I know that what I'm about to say will to some see, seem far-fetched and unbelievable, just as I find it far-fetched that an image shot thousands of miles away, can appear instantly on my television and that I can talk into a glass tablet and letters will appear on the face of the tablet. My story would not seem unbelievable to Teresa of Avila though. Some believe in the miraculous and others simply don't. Some stay rooted, feet on the ground and some adventure and pursue the invisible. In my dinner with Andre, there is an Andre who believes and a Wally who never will. The film needs both to exist. Probably we all do. Anyway, I finally looked up to see the Rinpoche. There, sitting on a small raised throne, was a paunchy elderly man with a long, long beard. I looked into his eyes. What I saw there seemed so not so much eyes as planets. These planets were all light. I began to weep and he began to laugh. The laughter I heard sounded like magnificent bells. I began to roar with laughter. He laughed more at my laughter and I began to weep again. I laughed and wept and wept and laughed. He spoke in a language I couldn't understand. And at the end of whatever he was saying, 
he took me by the hand and led me to the window. He pointed at the desert landscape. It was early afternoon, but the skies suddenly went black. Comets were streaking across the sky. As we drove out of the monastery, I was overtaken by a love more powerful than anything I had ever experienced. I adored him. I loved him. All I wanted to do was to stay with him. Wow. So, you know, as somebody who's never had an experience like that, I guess, you know, one of the things that drew me to doing this project with you and hearing your stories and absorbing them, one of the things that draws me to art and what draws me in some ways to um, images of the ecstatic, which this really was, is that's, that's the way I can ex access these kinds of extreme experiences. But as someone who had that experience and other experiences that are not, you know, normative, you know, are not usual, um, how does that stay with you? I mean, do you remember that in all vividness? Has his image stayed with you? Or is it just something that you return to as if it were a story from childhood? Uh, no, no, I think it stays with you forever. You know, it's like uh, people who fall in love and then somehow the love doesn't go anywhere. You never, ever forget what it was like to be in love. And... Of course, the experience that I just described is similar to dropping acid, which mm -hmm. I've never done. Mm -hmm. But we know from people, from descriptions of dropping acid, that the world, which often seems so ordinary, is a place of miracles. Mm -hmm. That things don't look the way we think they look. That there is a whole world of the mysterious and the ecstatic if we only are blessed enough to know how to access it. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build on that a little bit because, and we don't have time obviously to cover everything. I do want everybody to read this book because it's so, it goes so many places. Your life went so many places. Um, but, you know, we started and then I took over when you, Drop when you your uh, electricity went out, talking about the extravagance and theatricality of your early work. Then this kind of search for miracles really informs the work with the Manhattan Project, your famous Alice in Wonderland, your work with Jerzy Krotowski, um, and um, and then and I, I'm gonna I want to skip over that and just say that is work that is like actors doing things they shouldn't by all rights be able to do, but they are somehow... And people, and people if they read the book, can read all about it. Can read all about it. Here it is, a third place book. And, and, then, um, and then you go into this wilderness period and the stories that become My Dinner with Andre, and then you have this weird movie career that we barely touch on in the book where you're playing in all these movies. But then you return with the person, the, the playwright, who I think of as the least spiritual, the least political, the least miraculous playwright, although for me, the, the feelings are miraculous in Chekhov. You return to directing with Uncle Vanya. And I just want to say one thing before asking you about it. Seattle is a town of Chekhov fanatics. Oh. There's a wonderful theater in, in Seattle called the Seagull Project. All of the theaters in Seattle, it seems to me, have wrapped their arms around Chekhov at some point. The train, Why is that, do you think? I don't know. It must come from, I imagine, but I don't know, or if I knew, I don't remember. I think it actually comes a lot out of people who had been at the School of Drama when the country when the city was forming, uh, one great acting professor, Mark Jenkins, who used Chekhov all the time and his students stayed and formed these theaters and others. I don't know what the real genesis is, but why did you go back to Vanya? You had done Seagull in the Manhattan Project you had, and it hadn't gone well. You had done an Uncle Vanya, I think in Philadelphia. Why Chekhov? Why do you return? Oh. 
Chekhov, Beckett, and Wally Shawn, those are the three playwrights of my entire life. Yeah. Uh, I think Beckett is the greatest playwright since Shakespeare, uh, and Chekhov is probably the greatest playwright since Chekhov. (laughs) (laughs) Since Beckett, only before. Very mysterious writer. Uh, I would look, uh, I watched rehearsals. As you know, I used to rehearse for years. I think we rehearsed Banya for a couple of years. And for the life of me, after reading the play a hundred times and seeing it a thousand times, I still don't understand the miracle of his structure. Mm. I don't know how he did it. Yeah. And also, I think contrary to the way Chekhov is often performed as if it's a soap opera, as if the plot mattered. The plot doesn't matter. What's important about Chekhov is he gives you an acute sense of what it means to be here. Mm -hmm. What is it like to live a life? How does it feel? Yeah. And that's something I think we can all relate to. Yeah. I feel that about Chekhov too. I I feel like as he describes it, life as he describes it is more life like life that I've experienced than mm-hmm. anybody I've read. That sense that life goes on even as your world is falling apart. Right. You know, people come right. and go, you have dinner, and inside you are dying. Yeah. Um, or you're feeling extravagant love or whatever. Mm-hmm. But so how, do you, how does that translate over the course of your work life, Andre? You know, you start out with these like, you know, I was talking about Beckleck when you were um, when you your electricity was out and those kind of serious images and the the fire engine and fire bugs and then you go to a stripped down kind of miraculous theater with Alice in Wonderland, but it's still it's still imaginative, fantastic theater, and Chekhov is life as it is in some way, what is happening in you that would even attract you to Vanya? Oh, I guess maybe partly that my father was bipolar and he was always talking um, in the terrible grief that it is to be bipolar Mm -hmm. about how he hadn't lived the life he wanted to live. And Vanya's a little like that. You know, he's he's always mm-hmm. complaining about how nobody loves him. There's nobody to love. Well, why doesn't he just walk down the road and meet somebody, you know? <laughs> but he's trapped. He's trapped within himself. Um, we're all, uh, to some degree, trapped within the karma that we've inherited. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like... Um, Uh, like in marriage, say, um, you can't go live in Turkey and in Germany. You have to make a choice. Mm -hmm. And if you choose Germany, you have to give up Turkey. But then you have to live Germany to its absolute fullest. So we're all limited. You know, I find myself at the age of 86. I don't know how many years are left. And in spite of this extraordinarily flamboyant theatrical life I've led, there are things I never did uh, and never will. And Mm -hmm. that's who I am. Yeah. And do you find yourself longing for those things? I mean, to change, yeah. (laughs) No, No, they're kind of peaceful. I mean, this is part of what strikes me as, you know, the mystery of you as well as I've known you for 17 years, I've known your work for 45 years. Um, and we've been in conversation essentially for 17 years. And and um, one of the things that is mysterious to me that I think is at the heart of the book, which you sometimes describe as a novel, is that journey of that hostile, talented, angry, young wunderkind of the early theater, I remember seeing it. So Andre's um, Andre's wife, Cindy Klein, is a wonderful documentarian. And 
Um, one of her documentaries is called Before and After Dinner, and it's uh, it's about Andre and it's about their relationship. And there is a scene that she found in there of you being interviewed during the Manhattan Project years by Margaret Croydon on television. Margaret Croydon wrote about the avant-garde in America. And you are so, you got your cap on and you're so clear and such a sort of self-proclaimed genius and you're so brilliant and hostile and you know the whole thing and i remember i think cindy says in the movie if i had met him then i would never have gone out with him and i feel that way if i had met you then i might have wanted to see your plays but i never would have wanted to write a book with you, you yeah there was one, there's one critic that I, I was a loose cannon you loose I cannon was not i was right. not easy you were not easy but so now i know you to be this like 86 year old painter who loves life, you love your wife, you love, you know, obviously you have your angers, your rages, the things that drive you crazy. But what is that, that journey? What are there stages to it for you? Was there a moment of breakthrough? No, I don't think there was, I don't think there was one moment. But as you know, I've been in a lot of therapy. <laughs> a lot. And that helps, you know, you've been in therapy. And I've been blessed to have had a guru. And they say, lucky is the person who lives long enough to find a guru. So I, I've had theatrical teachers, spiritual teachers, shrinks, you know, and if you, uh, if you work on yourself, you know, it's like scrubbing, uh, scrubbing something clean. If you work and you work and you work and you work on yourself, change will happen yeah it and is that perseverance, yeah. perseverance is yeah. everything you know uh talent is cheap <laughs> but perseverance and hard work means more than anything so if you work on yourself and you're driven to work on yourself and you want to work on yourself something will happen you will change yeah i guess you'll grow into yourself in some way I keep thinking yeah. about that thing that Grotowski, you quoted Grotowski as saying to an actor. Do you remember what that was? Uh, when you first met him at the workshop. Yeah. <laughs> the, the actor asked Grotowski, what, what's the one piece of advice you can give me as an actor? And Grotowski said something like, um, I, I'm paraphrasing, be who you are. You, you can be um actor x but you can't be actor y you know you can oh, only uh, one man is born mr van gogh yeah one man is born mr x yeah if you're mr x you have to fully live the life of mr x you can't be uh mr van gogh but you know there was also a great english psychoanalyst whose name now i can't remember he worked primarily with underprivileged kids uh -huh. traumatized uh, underprivileged kids. And he felt that the whole purpose of psychoanalysis or therapy was to help you return to who you originally were. Yeah, Who you originally were is not the person your school made you into. It's not the person your parents wanted you to be. It's not the person the society and the culture wanted you to be. There was an original person in there. And the closer you can get to that, the happier you'll be. Yeah. I think that was Winnicott, maybe. Winnicott, yes. Yeah. You were, yeah. We. I want to turn, there's a couple of questions and I want to turn to them. Um, uh, I just want to kind of wrap this piece though, because I've been thinking about it. Do. Yeah. I want to say to people who want to ask questions, you can ask me about anything. <laughs> Uh, good. Nothing too personal. Don't be embarrassed. Good. Um, I'm sorry. What are you saying? No, no. It's just this thing about be, you know becoming oneself over time and how that is kind of the arc of a life. I was reading. I I actually wanted to read this to you. I came upon it the other day. I've been reading um, Thomas Merton's Seeds of Contemplation, oh, yeah. and he says, "For me to be a saint means to be myself." Therefore, the problem of sanctity and salvation is in the fact, the problem of finding out who I am 
and of developing my true self. Trees and animals have no problems. Problem, God makes them what they are without consulting them and they are perfectly satisfied. With us, it is different. God leaves us free to be whatever we like. Oh, and that's great. Isn't it beautiful? It's that yeah. thing that it's like the work of sanctifying your life is to grow into yourself, yes. not somebody yeah. else, you know? No. Yeah. Okay, we got some questions. Um, all right, they're both about my dinner with Andre so far. Uh, and bring on the questions, folks. Hi, Andre. I just watched Dinner with Andre in advance of this talk. In the movie, I felt that there was a lot of searching at a certain point in your life, which seems similar to the search of middle life, in middle life. What would you recommend to someone going through this season liminal period? Oh, uh, well, I don't think anything is wasted in life. I think, you know, it's, it's like people who fall in love and then the relationship doesn't work out. But you go on from that to something new. It teaches you, it takes you somewhere new. So I would say, don't be discouraged. Hang in there. Be patient. This is the same thing I would say to anybody now struggling uh, with the virus. It will end. It will change. You will be someone different. Hang in there. Yeah. I know, you know, as we worked on this over the years, and especially while I was at UW, I felt um, because I was working with so many students, so many burgeoning artists, I really felt your desire to talk to young artists and young people, yeah. both about the political situation and about becoming an artist, and to really sort of stress that perseverance, stick to it, don't let them get you down, you know? Is there, a, is there a particular story from your own life about a moment of sticking to something or being Oh, discouraged? yeah, there is one. Uh, the one that comes to mind, which is in the book, uh, is my dream as a young man was to go to the Yale Drama School. There was a legendary dean there. He would interview you. He interviewed me. And at the end of the interview, he said, you know, it's so hard to interview a young person because... They have no lines in their face, you know, they're tabula rasa, you know. They don't have the lines that I have now. And he said, so it's hard, it's hard. But occasionally, I do meet somebody who has absolutely no talent whatsoever. I beg you, don't go into the theater. The theater <laughs> is hard enough if you have talent. Become a doctor, become a lawyer. And, you know, I got on the train from... New Haven to New York, I probably cried the whole way, but I didn't give up. Yeah. There you go. It's a good thing. We don't remember the name of that dean. No. Um, so this is, I'm not sure if this is um, uh, someone who really doesn't know or if they're sort of tweaking you a little. They say, Andre, were you involved in the casting of my dinner with Andre? Your voice sounds remarkably identical to the Andre in the film. <laughs> I don't know if you're tweaking me or not, but yes, <laughs> yes we have a strange similarity. <laughs> but yeah. you, uh, th there is a, a story that I love after, uh, which I think is in the book, after my dinner with Andre opened, Wally and I were walking home from a master builder rehearsal and this fan rushed up to Wally and said, my God, my God, dinner with Andre. I've seen it eight times. How brilliant. You were a G. You know, he went on and on and Wally said, I suppose you know my friend here. And he looked at me and said, no, I don't think so. And I said, oh, I was the other guy. And he said, oh, and then he went back to talking to Wally, tried to hug him and walked down the street. Suddenly he rushed back. He said, I am so sorry. You were the waiter. You were terrific. <laughs> Maybe I was the waiter in my Maybe dinner. Maybe you were the waiter with it. With Maybe using me, yeah. Uh, here's a beautiful question. Um, can you talk about your painting? You're, you're painting now more than you're making theater, certainly during the pandemic. But really, since you turned about 70, it's mm -hmm. a huge part of your life. We see some of your work behind you and on the cover of the book. 
How has that helped you process life differently from writing, acting, and producing? Well, for one thing, you know, putting on a play uh, is a hell of a difficult thing. You have to find a rehearsal space, actors, money to pay the actors, uh, get schedules. Painting is great that way. You just walk into the studio, a paintbrush and the paints cost nothing. Uh, but the real difference, I think, is that most plays are filled with conflict. That's probably the nature of drama. Conflict and unhappiness and stress. Well, I don't feel that anymore. So when I look at an object, I see the beauty <laughs> in the object and I paint it. It, it seems so simple. And you know, uh, very often we look at a tree and we think, what a beautiful green tree. But the tree is really mauve and yellow and black and red, you know. Uh, so the discipline of really seeing to look at what's in front of you, what a great gift to be able to do that. Mm, yeah. And you always did that as a director. I mean, I've seen film of it, and I even before I knew you, I, you, you were sort of famous for sitting quietly month after month after month in rehearsal and just looking. Is yeah, it, it was the same thing. Yeah. It mm. was the same thing. The only difference is if you're watching actors working on a complex uh, play, you probably see a lot of unhappiness as right. well as joy. Uh, right. With the painting, all I feel is joy. Mm. There's a, a great phrase that I came upon just yesterday. I don't know. And I, so I have never asked. This is one of the few things I've never asked you. Um, Philip Roth, in his later years after he stopped writing, he retired from writing, he said he felt he was living posthumously. Do you uh -oh. feel that? Do you feel that? No. Uh only perhaps in the sense that people think I would never retire. I would never want to retire. But people think that people who do retire as they get older, they retire from life. But the fact is life retires from you. Mm. People walk more quickly. People are up to here with so many projects that you're not. It's as if the world recedes and you can feel a little bit like um, a ghost wandering in it. Mm. Yeah, but you you can't retire because one of the things that I'm so struck by, um, including in the book, is um, the sense that when your life is your work of art, as opposed to particular works being your life's work, you know, um, how can you retire from that? If you your can't. life is about perfecting yeah. your no, yeah. you can't. Yeah. You're in it till the end. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe beyond. <laughs> and maybe beyond. Well, this goes yeah. to the last question that I have here, and then I think we're at the end of our time, which is how have you incorporated your experience in Buddhism in Ladakh into your daily life? Or any of these. I would I would add to that, you know, any of your experiences with Guru Mai or any of those sort of religious, spiritual awakening? Well, I guess trying, and you can't always succeed. You know, right now I have a very painful knee that I have to get operated on. Um, you try to live somehow more ecstatically, more joyfully, mm -hmm. but you can't always. Um, you know, the spiritual practices say, wake up. Uh, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Uh, I don't know. I can't tell because I'm just a flower in a garden uh, <laughs> that a gardener has nurtured. So I'm not sure what I am. Say more. What does that mean that you're a flower in a garden, garden the gardener has nurtured? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think we are uh, at our time um oh someone says j scott burke says thank you both thank you thank you 
Thank um, you. Goodbye, Seattle. It's really wonderful being back in Seattle. Here's where to, to send us home, I guess. Uh, it feels all too fast, actually. What a what a delightful way to pass a beautiful day. Um, I can't think of anything I'd rather any two people I'd rather have been trapped inside with than than the two of you this afternoon. Can I exercise a um, Can I exercise an executive director's prerogative really quick and extend with a bonus question? Sure, Andre. As you <laughs> Andre, as you think about. Um, about the choices you have left to make with your time and life beyond job, is there another another artist or playwright, maybe specifically, you would choose to investigate again, like in this time now, um, as deeply as you have Chekhov over the years? Somebody you'd like to go back to? Wally Sean, Wally Sean, Wally Sean, Wally Sean. I suspected you'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> Does he have anything in the pipeline? Not that I know of. Okay. Well, you'll know uh, I, the rest, of it, that's for sure. And Andre is, in some measure, still working on Hedda Gabler. Uh, so not just Wally. And there, I get, I get emails every couple of months, maybe, that are like, do you have a good copy of Hamlet? Or have you read this novel? I want to dramatize it with actress X, you know? Um, you never but, know. You never know. I just, where there's something funny that happened today that I just have to share because it's kind of about Wally, because Wally's most famous picture obviously is Princess Bride. And he plays opposite, uh, among many other wonderful people, Andre the Giant. And the review of our book was in the New York Times today with the headline, I don't know if you can read it, it's like <laughs> Andre the Giant. <laughs> and there's a picture of Wally and Andre. Gorgeous. <laughs> Uh, we'll find the review um, because I imagine it's I imagine it isn't complimentary. But then, more important, um, find the book, and we've done it for you. It's right there. There's a big green button. See, the reason I come back on is so I can be the infomercial people. Okay, Use the, the green button on your screen um, <laughs> because as delightful as this was, I can only imagine um, how transformative it'll be to read. Um, Todd, uh, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. And um, and uh, I I I I wanted to leave myself imagining the world you still have to give us in the world because I know that um, you will you will give us everything you have until the very last of your breath. So um, I like thinking about you in the future, and I to see a gabbler. All right then, well, we'll see you, you all very soon. I might take up the harpsichord. I'll be there. We have one at all, just so you <laughs> know. If you ever need one. Just come out to Seattle. We'd love to have you back. Well, stay <laughs> thanks, safe. everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye bye.